so good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you for coming to this talk. Um, I want to introduce first myself. My name is Duncan McVicker. I am um, an employee of SUSE. I have been with SUSE for almost 11 years. Nowadays, I am the director of data center management, um, which is uh, the department that has uh, is responsible for some things like SUSE manager and SALT, among others. Um, this, um, I have been, this is not a, a marketing talk, so I'm not going to sell you salt here. This is a more technical talk. And um, this talk is, um, so why we wanted to do this talk? When we developed SUSE Manager 3, which is the, one of the reasons how salt came into SUSE, we also found some shortcomings in the SALT approach, in general, in the configuration management approach. And we did, together with the other SUSE engineers, some contribution to SALT. We are, now, we are now integrated into the SALT and SUSE manager that you can find in SUSE. And, and we added some of those shortcomings. And, and also, I want, to, I want to give you some guidance how you could do auditing and configuration, manage, uh, configuration drift with SALT and also give you an idea of what we will work on on the future in this area. So let's start with a story. Um, like in every organization, there was a time where you had these admins that um, managed their systems in a very special way. They were very attached to their servers. So they usually named, named their servers after planet of Star Wars or stuff like that. Uh, they had their own, they were experts in Bash, and they, um, they had a collection of scripts to do anything. At the same time, there was, it was not so easy for people to collaborate or start modifying the scripts of other sysadmins. There were a lot of controls and rules how to, um, how to touch servers that were already in production. Um, but, at some point, every company got, because of the projects that we are doing nowadays, mobile applications, everyone got a DevOps in the room, right? And, um, and in, from the DevOps world, um, they came with knowledge about certain types of tools. One of those were the, what we call configuration management tools. So these, these people had a, a different approach to do things. They started to use configuration management, put templates um, into, into Git, and start to use what we call the declarative approach. Who has, from here, experience already with some configuration management system? Who has uh, already experience with SALT itself? OK, that's much more than expected. Um, and this is what at SUSE we called the, the, true, the two brains of IT and it's probably one of the challenges that we as a company are facing right now, that our customers usually came from this world um, where you have long waterfall projects, uh, sysadmins, separated production, uh, IT departments, uh, developers are not allowed to get even close to the machines. And, but at the same time, those companies are also working in small websites that they need to, 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 to fulfill a small service or, so, or some mobile app and they need to deploy infrastructure very, very dynamically. So they end looking for this, right? And SUSE, as a, as a company, is trying to help you to, 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 to bridge those two worlds. So the new DevOps colleague explains to the sysadmin the tools I use if I write a state or a configuration for my servers and somebody breaks them, I just need to reapply that state and my servers will be fixed, right? That's how I was sold the configuration management uh, topic years ago. Um, so the, this sysadmin got curious and I started to do research. Sorry, I feel like I'm playing electric guitar here with this. Um, he got uh, curious and started to, uh, to find in Wikipedia what is configuration management. And one of the official definitions is that it's an engineering process to keep certain attributes 
uh, over a, or a product over its lifetime. And these attributes could be the attributes that, that make it be in production, right? So the guy gets very excited and and he also discovers that there are a lot of other things that come with this culture of DevOps, like because the people doing DevOps were usually developers, uh, they, um, they tend to know already how to manage change, right? Any developer that is already managing a lot of different versions of its own source code, so they, don't, they, they know how to manage versions, doing branching, doing tagging, doing code reviews, doing some of kind of quality checks, the problem is you cannot check in a server in Git, right? So, but that's, that's uh, where the, the concept of infrastructure as code comes from, is having developers close to the... So, because you cannot um, check in a server into Git, tools like uh, configuration management like Salt or Puppet came to, to fill that gap. How do they work? You're already a little bit familiar with Salt, so we'll do very quickly this part. Salt is a tool that um, simply creates the concept of minions, which are the managed client, and a master that is the owner of the configuration. There is a, tramp, a transport in between, which in the normal case is serum Q, but it's also abstract, so you can change it for something else. Now, Salt, the model of salt is around functions. Salt is not like Puppet that forces you to go to the declarative world. Salt starts with something much simpler, which is remote execution of functions. So it provides you with a library of, of uh, actions that you can call on servers. And then you can call those actions locally in your server, or you can call it on thousands of servers in parallel, or you can say call it on every server that starts with the word E, or you can say, do it in every server that has this model of a network card. So it comes with a library with functions like this one, package install, which is a very small abstraction layer on top of the operating system package manager. And the reason to abstract it a bit is because of multi-platform, so that you could use it in different Linux version operating system without so much problem. So this call will, will install the package foo in every server. This call will pause a Docker container called C001 in this that is running on this host. And then you have a very low level command like running a plain bash script, right? The nice thing about Salt, and that's the beauty of its architecture, is that the state system, which in other product is built on the, on the lower layer, is built on top of the, of the function. So there is a function to apply a state. That doesn't mean that all the time you're applying the state or correcting it like it CF Engine does, but you have to explicitly say, now I want to apply the state and tell Salt which state are you going to apply to the machine. Of course, you can also create a kind of a cron job or a, or a job that automatically does it all the time, but it gives you much more flexibility on the model that you're going to use. And as an architecture, Salt is all about sending commands to the machines and getting results back, and then reacting to those events to do new sending, new commands, and so on, until you close the loop. So what is a state? When before we talk about infrastructure as source code, um, Salt defines a, a way to express how a server should look like so that you can then pass it as a parameter to state apply and, and, and do this. Um, there is a small language which is based on YAML where you can say for the package module I want the Apache package always to be installed or the etc. mod D file needs to come from this source. So copy it from the server because I want the same in every computer. And on top of that there are multiple features like templating, you can take variables, you can query databases to fill missing information, but that's in general the, 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 the model that, that, that we are using. So states is nothing more than the configuration um, that is how Salt calls configuration in its declarative form. So let's imagine now that we have a system 
called Minion 1, um, where we have the same configuration I showed before, a standard etc. mod D file, and some package. And we apply this configuration. If you don't pass this parameter, salt will, if the etc. mod D file was touched by someone and modified, what will salt do? It will just override it, right? It will correct the state. Um, but salt allows you to test first the configuration. That will, and salt then will tell you, hey, I haven't changed anything, but this state for etc. mod D will, if, if I apply the configuration for real, it will be changed. And it will show you the diffs here, right? And this is very cool because this is the first step towards finding out which server is deviating from its configuration. So a new trainee comes to the company. He's given access to the servers. And the first thing he does, let's install a math server in one of the production servers. He adds a user so that it doesn't, you know, a lot of people think user are containers from the past. So he adds a user, special user for the server and runs the process there. So we run again the state application in test mode and we get exactly the same result back. And that was when I saw that, it was my first, my, my first surprise with configuration management. It tells you, yeah, the Tetra mod D file is different. What about the user that the trainee just added? It's not mentioned anywhere. So the change was not detected. It's not part of the configuration. We didn't tell Salt anything about this user. He's checking the policies against what we told it, but everything else, it's fine. The problem is, it's quite difficult to express what we, what, this thing about the user, because salt allows us to say the user joke needs to be present, but how do we tell it anything else that is not mentioned in the configuration should stay like usual? If we say any other user needs to be absent, we will end removing the root user, we will end removing the pulse audio user, the Apache user. And even if we have a list of the users that should be there, when we upgrade to the next version of SP, from SP1 to SP2, maybe there is a new system user in the system, so it's very hard to manage. So just like this disappointed guy, I was also disappointed. And I was disappointed that I, when, when we started to sell the idea of SUSE Manager with, with, with configuration management, we wanted to use it for auditing. We went to customers and customers immediately told us, so this is very cool. Now I can just apply the soul state and it will tell me about any change that, 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 that people did, right? Uh, no, <laughs> it will not. So the expectations were different with reality. Um, that this is in part because even if the declarative approach is being used in DevOps, the culture of DevOps is not about auditing existing systems. They don't have this relationship of naming their system after Star Wars planets. They name systems like web server 001 or 002. And if it's broken, they just destroy it. So what we know as configuration management tools, in reality, are automation tools, are tools that allow us to go from a base image into some desired state quickly. But if something didn't work, let's throw it away and fix it in a new machine. And that's where the problem comes from. So, but in the classical IT world, the priorities are different. They want to use the salt state not to create new machi machines in Amazon. Well, sometimes they do. But they also want to document their systems. They want to be able to go to Git and see who changed last time the, uh, the, uh, the production server. How can they, can, can they go back to a working state? And also use this as a piece of documentation to train new people. This is how we configure our servers in this company. Sorry. So all the problem here comes from the fact that there is incomplete configuration. When we say to salt, we have state and we have a set of scripts that can be um, used uh, together with the states to, to configure a system, we are missing something called the baseline, which is against what are we measuring things. In configuration management, the baseline is defined as an agreed description of the attributes of a product 
at any point in time, which serves as a basis for defining change. Um, the, the question is, how do we define this, this, this baseline and how do we make SALT aware of it? So in the DevOps world, they don't care much about these baselines because they use either Docker containers, which are already a baseline, they are static, they are immutable, or they are using uh, images, for example. A lot of companies just create a golden image by some department, and then that's the master image everyone has to use. But how to do this in a more lightweight way? So we look at a lot of solutions, and we found that it was very, very hard to try to express a baseline using uh, a declarative language. But at some point, we look back at our, at our own distribution that we have a tool called Snapper. And the interesting thing is that Snapper is not new. We demoed it the first time in 2011. I'm not sure if you were in that SUSECON where Matthias Eckerman, together with Greg uh, Crow Hartman, they destroyed intentionally a web server and then put it back into production. Since then, Snapper has improve a lot, but the snapper is to snapshots to what zipper or apt-get or DNF are to packages. It gives the user a tool with a defined workflow and some usability to manage snapshots. And it's a tool that is not very um, known, but is already very mature and very powerful. We created, it was created at SUSE, because also SUSE was one of the First, I think it's still the first distro to use ButterFS as a default file system. But nowadays, Snapper, you can find it in any, in any distribution. So Arch Linux, Fedora, Debian, they all shipped Snapper as well. Oh, don't forget to mention ButterFS. Yes, the only caveat about Snapper is that it's required ButterFS in your root file system. If you want to manage or, where, or whatever the configuration or the data you are trying to, to manage, um, needs to be on the, on the battery of approach. But for SUSE customers, it's a default file system, right? So it's not something, uh, an extra requirement. Um, how does a Snapper look like? And there are a lot of nice features that were introduced afterwards. Snapper, um, just like the zipper command, it has a series of subs command to list configuration, to uh, list all the snapshots that you have created to mount a snapshot so that you, you can inspect the content of the snapshot, uh, to make a diff between two snapshots and maybe some files so you can inspect what changed between that point and that point. But the nicer feature about Snapper is what happens if I installed my kernel or some package, everything is broken, and then I said, I forgot to take a snapshot of my working system. So that's not a technical problem, it's a social problem. Humans forget to take backups as well, right? Um, so the best feature of, uh, of Snapper is that it includes some plugins or hooks that make Zipper and Yast take snapshots automatically for you. Every time you open Yast in SLE 12 and you change something and then press accept, uh, Snapper it takes a snapshot before and afterwards so that then you can go back to Yast and say, what did I change my last time? And those snapshots are pretty cheap because it's a copy and write file system. By the way, I learned that Butter is because it comes from the cow, the copy on write file system. That was, and, and the same with zipper. Every time you do zipper uh, install a package, it will make a snapshot before so that you can roll back. And if you were not aware, if you install a kernel and the kernel is broken, the, the graph uh, menu in SUSE Linux Enterprise 12 allows you to boot into the working one. So you can boot, fix your stuff, and then make that the default snapshot. So it includes as well a, a, a nice YAST module. What is that? Uh -huh. uh, with, the, with the YAST module, you can inspect visually all the, all, the, all the diffs. So we saw this is a perfect way to define a baseline. So we gathered some engineers from the Swiss manager team, and we started to develop this in small iterations. And the first one was to expose all the Snapper functionality on salt, so that everything that you can get from the command line client, you can get it um, in, as a salt command, which gives you the ability to run it in a lot of machines in parallel, 
it gives you the ability to return data in a structured way because we don't parse the command line, we go to the Diva service of Snapper, which gives you the data in a structured way. And once you have the data in a structured way, it means you can make uh, cron jobs that automatically list the snapshots every hour. You can save it back into your reactors and use all the, the salt framework to control that. That was the first part. This was intentional left blank. I'm not sure what the persons of that prepared this tried to do. I think it's time for a joke here or something. <laughs> I don't have any joke. Um, and the second step was um, the same way that Zipper can take a snapshot before and after when you run something. I'm not sure who is familiar here with uh, functional programming or um, what a lambda is. So you have a function like file append in salt that you can call directly salt file append some content into the mod D file. A lambda is, is a function that you can pass to another function, right? So we created a function called snapper run which takes as a parameter another function like file append and allows you to call a salt, com a salt command but creating the snapshot before and afterwards. And that gets very powerful because as we saw, we, we saw before, a state application inside of uh, salt is also a function. So that means we could run an state run and have a snapshot before and afterwards. Another interesting thing that you might see here is that when salt runs a function using the snapper run, snapper allows to inject metadata into the snapshot. So we associate the snapshot in the hard disk with the salt job that was executed. And that allows us for even more functionality. So this functionality means that instead of having to look at the file system for the snapshot number that you want to revert, you can just tell salt revert me or, or show me the diff of the salt job ID foo. And we don't need to care about the snapshot numbers because we store the job IDs inside of the snapshot we look which is the right snapshot for the right salt job and control that. So that was the first, the first iteration to have a very nice module to abstract snapper inside of, uh, of salt. We still have not solved the problem of configuration drift. We are still missing the state part. So, Going back to the problem we had before, let's imagine for a second that we could do this. A part of saying that I need this mod D file in my configuration and I need a Apache package installed, that I could say all of this starting from this baseline. So that if a baseline that includes which users were in the system and other config or other configuration files that are not expressed in the salt file. So that's exactly what we did. So you can write with the, with the snapper state module, you can say, start from the baseline with the snapshot number 20. Ignore everything else in these directories and then apply the rest of the configuration. What kind of power does this give you? It gives you the power that if someone adds a new user and you apply the state in test mode, you can see that the first change that Salt now found is that there is somebody modified, etc. password file. What will happen if you, if you apply the state now without passing uh, test equal true? What will happen is that every time that we apply our state, we will revert all the system to the known state and then apply the configuration. That gives you a kind of a, a safety measure. You can, you can take a snapshot of the last working system, write your salt configuration files, and have the peace of mind that they apply very cleanly on top of that state. Then we also realized that um, managing a snapshot by number, sorry, oh, what did I do? Okay. Maybe it's the laptop. <laughs> okay. 
um, referring to snapshots by number inside of the, of the salt file is kind of clunky. Uh, what is going on here? Um, so, sorry, let me try to see if something is going on here. Um, it's, very, it's very hard to refer to snapshot by number. So what we did was to allow that you can tag a snapshot with the tag baseline, and then salt will refer to, uh, will, will look for the latest, ta latest snapshot that has the baseline tag. That means that you don't, you don't anymore need to change your salt files all the time. Um, you just need to move the baseline tag. It's like doing a git commit, right? You take a new snapshot, you, you just tag it again. So instead of saying by number, you will say, my tag is baseline, and then you forget about your salt state. You just operate with snapper, take a new snapshot, and add the tag baseline to your new snapshot, which is like tagging it. You, you do a commit, and you say, my commit is good, I do a tag to it. What is then the advantage of this system? That now you have a complete workflow where you can take a snapshot of a working system, even if the snapshot already includes the configuration that you have installed, if you apply that configuration, it will, nothing will change because it's already in the snapshot. Um, and then if someone changes by hand something, you will see it. But you are still free to now take that change and explicitly put it into the configuration and at the same time move it into the baseline. So you can iterate as a circle, right? You configure stuff, you see drift, you document by putting it into your salt state, and then you make a new baseline. The salt snapper module um, is available in, um, we already submitted it upstream. It will be part of the carbon release of salt, but because you are less customers, I guess, you know that you get the goodies backported. So if you use SUSE Manager, uh, the version of salt that shipped with SUSE Manager, with storage, and with all the other products already has the, the, the snapper module backported. And upstream, um, they also added extra functionality that we haven't backported yet, which allow you to, allows you to put hooks in the, in, the in, the, in the configuration to automatically take snapshots when you create, when you apply state. It's something that if you look at the slides I presented before, you need to do it explicitly for now. Uh, in, the, in the upstream version of Salt, you can set it in automatic mode so that every, every snapshot will be, uh, uh, every state apply will be snapshotted before and afterwards. Yeah, this is to remind you that the fact that you can do snap and run with any function means that you can also snapshot, even if we don't have the functionality that we sent, uh, that Upstream did to take snapshots of state applications, you can simulate that by just running a state apply on top of snap and run. That gives you exactly the same effect. So that's, that's one thing that we did at SUSE to, um, to improve configuration drift. But there are other things that you can do with salt that are, can be combined together with the snapper things to manage configuration drift, and I want to guide you over, uh, over some of them. The first one is um, the salt survey module. What is the survey runner module? Um, just like the snapper module allows you to run any function and do snapshotting before and after, the, the survey diff module allow, allows you to give another function that you are going to execute in a cluster of minions, and then it will group all the, by, based on the results it gets from every machine, it will group the machines based on results. What does it mean for you? If you have 100 servers that are supposed to have the same configuration, and you see that there is one that is misbehaving, but you don't know which one, and you're suspecting that somebody touched the cetera host file in one of them, you can just run salt run survey diff, run me the command cat etc. host on every machine, and you will get one group with all the machines that have the same etc. host file, 
and one group with a machine that has a different host file. This command is very powerful, and of course you cannot use it in automatic ways. You can just put it into the reactor, run this, and archive the results, and then you have even some kind of logging for, for auditing. There is another tool included in SALT, which um, is called the package diff. Package diff, what it does, it looks at the file in the file system, it looks at which package it belongs, tries to download the latest version of that package from the repositories, and, and then unpack the, unpack the package from the repositories and show you the difference between that. So basically it's telling you what is the difference between the, the, the official file from SUSE to the file that I have installed, which can be very useful if you want to detect intrusions, for example. Somebody modified some script. And of course you can run this command on top of the salt survey that we saw before. So we could look from all the package, all the, 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 the servers, which one is the server that has a different file from the one that it should be installed with the operating system. On top of that, there is a project called Hubble. Hubble, you know that um, uh, salt comes from Salt Lake City. There is a lot of people working uh, in salt, uh, also in, in, in that have, uh, that they are familiar with salt, and they are working in Adobe, which is very close to salt in, in Salt Lake City. And Hubble, what they did is that they built, like we have the state system, subsystem on top of the salt infrastructure, they built something very similar to the state system, which is not the same, it's different. Instead of being designed to run, um, to, to take files and, 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 and to apply certain configuration, it allows you to describe a um, lot of forms of auditing. Um, and on top of that, they have a file integrity monitor, they have tools to query infrastructure, oh, this is annoying, um, and they have some um, reporting tools. So for example, Nova, which is the tool that they, uh, that they provide to do uh, auditing, supports, uh, it has modules for CV scan, it has module for um, kernel parameters, uh, install packages, so you can even define if your system um, fulfills certain government certifications. You can enter the code of the certification and it will tell you how deviated you are from that system. And, so, and, and Hubble is, is, was created on top of SALT, so you can just put it inside of your SALT and distribute all the files automatically using SALT. SUSE is not packaging or distributing Hubble stack yet, but it's something we'll look into. But because it's compatible, if you are using SALT, there should be no problem to just take SALT, uh, Hubble from, from upstream and, and start using it. Now, where are we going now with this? When, um, when we reevaluate these um, two brains of IT, um, it's clear that a lot of the workload in the future will go um, to different paradigms of deployment. When we were looking for the perfect baseline, which one is the perfect baseline right now in, in the DevOps world? I think everyone, sorry? I cannot hear you. Mode mo 2. Ah, mode 2, yeah, yeah. I mean, mode 2 is for sure. I mean, mode 2 is, is unavoidable. It's, it's already here. Um, but in the mode 1, we have certain tools to, to do our deployment. There are some things that are in between. And then in the mode 2, we are getting complete different tools to do deployment of applications. And one of the reasons is because in this mode, there is the perfect baseline, which is um, Docker images, right? And the problem with Docker images is it comes with a complete set of tools to create them, to maintain them, to outdate them, and you have to, if you already, I came 
last year and sold you all this salt stuff. So you spent all year documenting your uh, servers, which packages needs to be installed, which configuration files you needed to have. You, you created those libraries of templates and you put, um, and you have now all this, and now somebody's telling you that in order to, um, to deploy your, your, your applications, you need to create container images and learn a complete different format for this, you know? Um, so we, we thought into that use case because right now we are selling SUSE Manager and we are telling people to start creating those libraries of templates, uh, scripts, and, and salt state. But at the same time, we know that the future and the, and the right way of deploying applications in the long run will be things like Kubernetes or, um, or running Kubernetes on top of OpenStack or using containers in some form. So we, um, we started to add support as well for SALT to be able to build Docker images using SALT description files so that you can um, use a standard um, state. What we are doing here is saying salt, go to this node in the cluster and apply that state into, uh, into, some, con into some container. So we first build the ability to apply a state inside of a Docker container, which was already kind of challenging because salt is not running inside of the container and the container might be doesn't have salt installed internally and we didn't imagine that we have to install salt inside of the container apply the state and then remove salt that would be pretty pretty complicated so using some of the technology that salt ssh already includes with salt we created the ability that you can apply a state in a running container What are the benefits of doing this? The benefit is that um, first you can reuse everything you have. And the second benefit is what happens if you need to create a Docker image and you need to inject into it something that you need to dynamically query from the, infrast for the, rest, from the rest of the infrastructure? Or let's say you have to create a Docker image and you need to put a configuration file there. I have seen some of Docker images check it in in Git. They have to have all the scripts in the same directory. And of course, you cannot reuse then those scripts in, in other servers. If you use um, Docker to, uh, sorry, Salt to build the Docker images, you can just inject, you can access all the template. You can access pillar data to render the, the template. You can access secrets from the pillar data. And pillar data, if you have been on the Salt, uh, on the other Salt sessions, you can query pillar data from LDAP servers, from other pieces of infrastructure, and you can, do, you can do that directly from salt. And of course, also means that you don't need to have a plain bash script in your Docker files. Your Docker files are full of zipper installed something, cut some file and grep and so on. You can use all the salt modules that salt already ships to do the configuration. So we implemented creating Docker images by applying some state inside of the container and then committing to it. So committing that result. And there is another uh, feature that we envision that is not working yet, but just as before I show you that there are tools for doing auditing like Hubble stack that work on top of salt. If we can run salt inside of containers, it means that we can also audit those containers. And that will be the next step. This feature is not yet, is upstream, but it's not yet um, backported. So this is uh, one of the next steps. And with that, you have Snapper, you have um, the Hubble stack, all the included tools about survey, and now in the future you will have also Docker, and that kind of closes the circle to doing proper configuration drift um, with salt. And of course, the next step will be also to put all this into the system manager UI. You know, if you can apply a state and we have snapshot of those states being allowing the user to just with one button go back, that will be also uh, a nice milestone. Mm -hmm. And that is, thank you for listening. <laughs>